Hey everyone, this is Darkfire Slide back with a well, a new episode of Europe Universalis 4. Um, it is not our introductory campaign as Castile, but it is still a tutorial video. Um, today, I uh, I was asked a while ago by a viewer named Web Gremlin. Uh, thank you for asking this, by the way. Um, about how combat works in EU4 on a very like specific level. And I wanted to, and it's been a while, I've been really busy with school, um, it's really been like killing me and killing my time and um, killing my enjoyment of games almost. Well, okay, maybe not that much, but <laughs> okay. Um, but today I'm playing as Germany, uh, one of the, you know, a formable nation out of the HRE. Um, and notwithstanding the circumstances, we're just going to dive right into uh, how combat works in EU4. Uh, just, just purely combat. Um, right, so... Combat in EU4 is affected by a large, large number of factors. Um, and I'm going to attempt to list all those factors um, in order. Um, one, of, one of the ones you wouldn't expect at first uh, is prestige. Um, and the reason prestige is so good is because it raises your army's morale um, by a percentage. Um, you know, I, I, it's like, you know, 70 is 7%, uh, so if you have 100 prestige, you get a 10% bonus to your morale. Which maybe doesn't sound like much until you realize how morale actually works. Um, I believe I mentioned it in my Castile video, but I'll say it again. Morale is basically like a, the health bar of an army. Um, it represents your troops' willingness to fight, and the more morale you lose, the more troops you lose. Not because people are dying, but because people are deserting, usually. Um, though they're also dying as well. Um... Anyway, um, so prestige affects that. Uh, power projection also affects uh, morale of armies, though to a lesser degree than prestige, because it's much easier to get prestige than uh, power projection. Um, so both of these are things you should be trying to get at all times if, if you want to, you know, get your military up. But prestige is always just a good thing to have, just because of the um, massive benefits it provides. Um, that being said, going into the actual stats, um, first we're going to look at our technology. Um, we are at Military Tech 26, it is the year 1728, and, um, at Tech 26 exactly, you get a bonus to your morale. So, you, uh, at, at Tech 26, you have a base morale of 5. Um, you know, if you're, prior to Tech 26, you have a base morale of 4, um, and so on. And if you notice, um, it says, you know, improve by, you know, 2, improve by 0.5. Um, tech 3 and 4 are extremely important. Um, if you can get that advantage over people in the early game, um, like a like a tech 4 over a tech 3 advantage is actually, like, huge. Um, 0.5 of a morale is actually insane. Um, and then, obviously, it, it doesn't go up until tech 15, tech 26, and then once again at tech 30, um, which is, you know, the last part of the game. Um... But in the technology tree, we can see that there's a lot of lot of stuff going on that we need to talk about. Um, next is military tactics, and it's hard to quantify the actual effect of military tactics. What you need to know about military tactics is that it uh, deflects casualties, um, just the same way that defensive unit pips do, um, which I'll explain in a minute uh, more about the unit pips. But um, if you want to know the exact formula, uh, I've tried reading it multiple times on the wiki, um, and even the wiki isn't 100% sure on, on the formula uh, for how it actually works. But what you need to know is that anytime you have a tactics advantage, you're going to take less casualties. Um, in general, with combat, you want to have the advantage in every single aspect that you possibly can. Um, so just something to bear in mind. Um, Next, we have a uh, combat with. Combat with is kind of an arcane concept, I think. Um, but the main thing that uh, you need to know about combat with is it affects literally how like big your line is, um, how many troops you can have in it. So the thing is, if you have a combat with a 25, like I do right now, um, which is actually the max, I think, um, then the most troops that can fight at a given time is going to be 25. So, out of this army of 27, which is why I keep zooming in and out, um, because I have a combat width of 25, out of this unit of 27, only uh, 25 of these regiments are actually going to be able to fight at the same time. Um, and I played this campaign a while ago, I didn't know about unit composition, but basically, 
um, the kind of unit composition you have, you want to have, uh, you can basically have a number of infantry and artillery that's equal. Um, because the thing is, infantry always take up the front lines. So any anything more in the front line um, is just going to be filled by either cavalry or cannons, which which suck in the front line. Um, and this will make more sense when I actually uh, go engage these rebels. Um, I waited for them to spawn so I could kind of show how the combat works um, in practice. Um, and then, the, but then the last thing uh, that we need to know is uh, flanking range. And basically, flanking range affects uh, in the actual line how far around. Uh, your troops can go, um, especially like if you have a combat with advantage, uh, making utilizing flanking range is actually like extremely important uh, with cavalry, and uh, cannons as well uh, can utilize flanking range. Oddly enough, um, anyway, other things that are going to affect our combat ability are going to be our army tradition. Uh, currently, we are at a 23.5% mor uh, morale bonus uh, combined with the other 10%, so we're at about a 33% more uh, morale of armies bonus. Um, just, just period. And, um, the thing is about EU4, uh, and its combat is, everything is going to be comparative. Um, you know, mor your morale is going to be comparative to their morale. So if you have an advantage, it doesn't really matter so much what your actual value is, so long as you have the advantage in morale. Um, and the thing is about, um, EU4 combat, um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's not really, it, it's dependent on how much you have that's better than your opponent's. Um, there is a die roll, but rarely ever is EU4 combat, like, equal. So, just something to bear in mind when we talk about that. Um, as you can see, the nice thing about it is you don't have to necessarily, uh, calculate what your morale is. It tells you right here on your military tab. Uh, and we have 6.6 .6 base morale, which is insanely good. Um, and I don't believe... Yeah, and that's without any bonuses. Uh, countries like France, Austria, I believe Spain might get it as well. Um, get a percentage bonus to their land morale. I think France actually gets like a 20%. So if you can imagine that, it'd be an even larger number for them. Probably around 7 or so. Uh, which means they're going to fight longer. Um, but that isn't all that there is to combat. Uh, military tactics is extremely uh, important, as we've mentioned. Um, and the last truly important value when fighting uh, battles, and, and I cannot overstate how useful uh, this is, um, discipline is uh, exceptionally, like, important for if you want to build a good army. Um, if anytime you want to play a nation and you want to have a strong military, look for ones that have uh, discipline bonuses and morale bonuses. But discipline especially is an extremely important uh, modifier. Um, the way I read it, and this may not be true as much anymore, for every 5% discipline that you have over your opponent, uh, you know, every 5% discipline better than you are than your opponent, um, you will get, your troops are essentially 20% more effective. So, if we were to fight somebody with no discipline, with our 120% discipline, um, we would have essentially a, uh, our troops would essentially be 80% more effective. Um, so discipline is just absolutely, like, absurdly good. Um, so yeah. If you're looking to build a military faction, keep in mind discipline and land morale, especially now with El Dorado out. Um, if you want to build a nation that has a good military, um, discipline and land morale are the best way to go. Um, the last thing that really affects your troops, and I actually have it here, um, I formed Germany as Bavaria, so one of my traditions is that I have combat, uh, cavalry combat ability plus 10%, and that's honestly the most straightforward of the uh, concepts to explain. Anytime it says uh, whatever combat ability plus 10%, um, that means those troops are literally just 10% more effective. So if you have 10 cavalry and you're, they're 10% more effective, they're going to essentially function as 11 cavalry. So, it's really good. Um, and then finally, let's talk about unit pips. Um, much like with uh, the, the rolling and how casualties are calculated, uh, pips are a very... Um, they're an integral part of combat, but they're also very hard to explain. Uh, and just like with military tactics, of course. Um, but what you need to know for, for combat's sake is essentially... Um, for unit pips, um, when you wanted, when you decide what unit you want, um, you need to bear in mind that offense is going to increase the damage. So the the orange pips are the offensive pips that your units get. Offensive pips are going to always increase the damage that you do uh, during combat, uh, regard basically regardless of the phase. Um, you know, check me on that if you're not, because that's the way I, I read it on the wiki, and that's 
my understanding of it at this point. Um, <clears throat> so, understanding that, um, you can see here that, like, obviously cavalry are going to have really high pips. So during, uh, and these represent uh, the two phases, and then there's obviously morale, which for some reason there's no, like, tooltip for it. But basically, um, your fire pips are going to be how much damage you do during the fire phase, um, and shock pips are going to be how much you do during the uh, shock phase. Um, but morale pips are actually extremely important because they directly affect how much morale damage you do and how much morale damage you take uh, during each phase. So... If we go to the uh, military tab, um, we have a lot of different options for infantry. Um, for example, if we wanted a really good uh, defensive infantry unit, we might want to go with either the Redcoat Infantry, which have a really resilient like fire score. So if our enemies are utilizing a lot of cannons, we might want to use uh, Redcoats because they would take less damage from that. Um, conversely, if, we, if our army morale is less and we want to make sure our, our units aren't routing so much, um, we could switch to these White Coat Infantry and uh, utilize their uh, defensive morale. So, that's basically how pips work. Um, and yeah, as far as army composition goes, it's really going to depend on the nation you're playing, but since most of the time you're playing Western nations, I'll explain it for them. Um, for Western nations, you want to have probably about an equal number of infantry and artillery regiments. Um, like I said, these, these units aren't necessarily built like that because I didn't know back when I was playing this campaign that... Uh, that that's how it worked. So these 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 regiments have a lot more infantry in them, um, which is fine. I have quality ideas, which is going to raise their combat ability. Um, in general, you don't want to have, uh, and I'll, I'll explain this. When it comes to cavalry for Western nations, um, you cannot have more than fifty percent of your units be cavalry. Now you may think to yourself, like, okay, you know, if I have seven infantry, I could have seven cavalry, because that would only be fifty percent of my army. Well, the thing is, infantry always take the brunt of the attacks when you're doing combat. So, you're going to lose a lot of infantry in every engagement that you have, more or less. And for cavalry, um, you really, for for Western nations, probably like a 30 to 35, or even, like, if you're feeling risky, like a 40% um, cavalry, uh, like, mix. Especially in the early game, like, I should clarify, like, in the early game, having that much cavalry is a good thing. In the later game, really, you want to focus more on artillery, since uh, infantry are going to be able to cover both roles. Um... And these units are more of support units. Um, not that this is a bad army composition, mind you. I, I probably, if I were to revise it, I would probably maybe take off like one infantry regiment and put in another artillery. Um, but that's more or less uh, what you need to know about unit composition. So anyway, we're going to move these armies into range of these... Uh, yeah, of these uh, armies. Let the time pass pretty quickly here. Wait until they get there. Alright, so this army's in position. Um, oh yeah, I totally forgot. Uh, and this is, you know, just goes to show how uh, how complicated combat is in EU4. But the last thing, I think this is the last thing, um, is your leader. And um, how leaders work is it's kind of like discipline, it's comparative. Um, you know, leaders have, obviously, um, they have uh, pips, much like the uh, units do. And... What pips are going to do is, uh, for generals, is they're going to add to the uh, your die roll during each phase of combat. Um, but obviously, you can see, you know, um, you have four stats for generals. Um, but what you what you need you don't need to worry about siege when you're actually fighting battles. Don't worry about siege. Um, what you do need to know is your shock, fire, and maneuver, and then know how well how good those are um, compared to your enemy. So if you have a five shock. But your enemy's general also has a five shock. The effect is essentially negated, and the same goes for fire. How maneuver works is uh, equally interesting. A maneuver is great for countries that have really crappy terrain. So in Austria, for example, having a leader with a great maneuver score um, is going to be really helpful, and that's because maneuver affects um, how combat works when you're actually moving in and out of territories. Um, as well as the terrain. Uh, one important map mode, its I know it's not default. Uh, normally it's down here in the bottom. Um, I actually said it's in my hotbar because I find it to be a lot more useful than the, the actual terrain map mode. But uh, the simple terrain map mode um, shows all the different terrains and stuff. And uh, I believe, yeah, if you mouse over, it just tells you, you know, oh, this is a woods territory. Um, and if we click on these, um, we can see woods... Uh, our, our attacking die roll is going to be down by one. 
which kind of sucks. Um, but then also our combat width is going to go down by 20%, which is a big, you know, which is a big deal um, for both armies, really. Um, it's, it basically means more troops are going to get funneled and die as a result, especially for the attacking uh, enemy. But anyway, um, our leader here has a three maneuver versus their zero, and I believe for every maneuver advantage you have over your enemy, you get, um, yeah, for every maneuver point advantage that you have over your opponent, you can essentially, uh, when you're attacking, negate um, some of the terrain penalties. So we're going to move this army here, this uh, this uh, 6 2 3 into, uh, into Potsdam here. We'll slow it down a bit. They will arrive on the uh, 30th. Okay, so here we go. Alright, so... So here we here we can kind of see what's going on here. Um, now these are rebels. I believe their morale. It says their morale is 6.3, but I believe their actual effective morale is usually a lot less. Uh, their army composition is comparable to ours. But anyway, um, I'm going to show you uh, like how the lines work and how combat width um, is affected by this. So um, I think the combat width minus 20% honestly might just be for a. Uh, yeah, that might honestly just be for the attacker, because as you can see, our line is a lot smaller than theirs, even though we have, like, a, a larger combat width. Though, technically, they're our rebels, so they have the same, um, tech as us. But anyway, as you can see, from the first fire, we, we lost 500, about 500 troops, and we took out about 1,500, and this is because our discipline advantage is 20% higher than theirs. So every, every, you know, essentially we're fighting with an army that is much, much bigger. Al almost double as effective as it actually is. Um, but to look at it here, at the, uh, at the die rolls themselves, um, as you can see, we, uh, when you roll a die, it is a number between 0 and 9, which is weird to think about because you shouldn't be able to roll a 0, but um, our leader, since they don't have a leader, um, every time we roll we get this added to our, our actual, like, like attack. And to be honest, we're probably going to kill this army in the fire phase. Um, but if we look at the lines here, um, we have a bunch, you know, we have our, our blobs of infantry here. Um, and the thing is, most of their, uh, most of their units are in the front, and they actually have, like, the, the flanking advantage on us, right? Um, and they... Their cannons are actually more effective than ours. So really, if um, if they had the same discipline as us, this would actually this actually might be a slightly losing battle, uh, notwithstanding that their uh, their morale is lower than ours by 0.4, which is kind of a it, it is kind of a lot. Um, but at this stage in the game, it's not as big of a deal as it is when you're at you know tech three and four. Um, we're gonna pause it, let another day pass, just so you can see the casualty count from the next roll. Because the thing is, each phase, um, it rolls a die for each phase. So here we can see, um, it has been three days, so now we are into the shock phase. Um, their troops are suffering massive casualties. Does it, does it, I guess it doesn't say, I think it, I thought there was a way of telling if, um, Units were actually in the front. But anyway, uh, you can see what the unit's current morale is. So all these infantry in the front are basically out of morale. And really, the only units left with morale might be their cat. Yeah, their cavalry are the only units that have any uh, any morale left. And that's because we've just pummeled through their lines. But um, as you can kind of see, when, you know, as the tooltip kind of blocks it horribly, um, during this stage in the game, units can attack really large amounts of... Uh, of units, and, th and this is kind of where flanking range comes into play, right? See, this uh, this regiment right here can just attack like a ton of units, and that's what makes cavalry so great. They can they can attack a lot more uh, units than infantry can. In the early stages of the game, especially, I know infantry can only attack about like three. Yeah, they don't have that improved flanking range, so their infantry can only attack like three of ours, but we can attack like five of theirs per uh, per phase, basically. But as you can see, they rolled a seven. Um, we negated the river crossing with our maneuver, um, but we didn't, we weren't unable to negate the woods. So, we're still suffering a minus one. So, effectively, our die roll right now is about a five. 
Uh, and there's effectively a 7. But again, because we have that massive discipline bonus, uh, we're going to win this combat anyway. So I'm going to go ahead and pause. And uh, we'll see we're actually taking more casualties during this phase. But then back into the fire phase, uh, their units are going to suffer more casualties. And it's really it's just going to be dependent on the die rolls as well. Um, so there is kind of that RNG element to it. Um, so yeah, we, uh, we actually lost a good number of troops fighting those rebels there. Um, we lost about, uh, yeah, 8,000 men. So the rebels did, did a really good job. Um, so let's see here. We have a 356 here, which is pretty great for us. They have a general, um, but we have a 6 in maneuver. I think we actually might be able to negate their terrain bonuses like altogether. But we're going to go ahead and move into Saxony just to do another demonstration of how combat works, and then I will conclude the video. So let's see, when will he arrive? In December 25th. All right. All right. So we are still suffering the minus one. Uh, we are at the we're at a penalty once again. Uh, we didn't roll so well, and our fire advantage is not that great. So as you can see, we're actually losing more troops than we're killing. But, but then during the shock phase, because we have such a such a like a commander advantage, um, our, our units are actually going to die. So another thing to consider during the early game versus the late game, fire during the early game is basically useless. So always try to roll for commanders that have really high shock values. Um, because that's when most of the damage is going to be done. But as you can see here, um, a lot more fire damage often gets done. And the thing is about combat with, um, as I was saying, um, if you have any more units than 25 that you have, um, they're going to fill the lines, but how they're going to do it is essentially they fill in as reinforcements as regiments die off. So... When you, when you build big armies, like, always keep in mind your combat with, and whether or not, like, obviously if they have a stack of 40, you're going to need a stack of 40 to fight it, but bear in mind that, you know, 40 units can't actually fight at the same time. Um, if your combat with were 20, for example, you would have double as many units as you could actually fit into the line itself. So, um, that's why big battles like that are usually, like, massive slogs, and, you know, the casualties are so high for each, uh, for each nation involved, because, you know, troops have to keep filling in those spots because combat width isn't high enough. But, um, anyway, I hope that kind of demonstrated how combat works, um, and how effective, like, how having a discipline advantage helps, how having a prestige and power projection and morale advantage works, um, and, uh, how casualties actually works. One, one last thing I'll mention is, um, when it comes to unit pips, um, when you, when you use... Uh, like fire and shock pips, um, those are going to inflict more actual casualties. Like these are actually going to kill people. Morale is just going to make them retreat. So it depends on whether or not you want to just like kill more of their army, like if they have low manpower or something, or if you just want to make them retreat so you can win the battle and eventually like rout their entire army. Um, so that's just another decision you could think about um, as you're doing this. But anyway, um, I hope this kind of explained how uh, the combat in EU4 works. So this video actually ended up being a lot longer than I was wanting it to be, but combat is very complex in EU4, and I felt it was deserved. Um, that being said, uh, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned a lot about uh, how the combat uh, works in EU4, and um, if you have any more questions, post them in the comments, and I'll try to answer them as best I can. Um, I'll post I'll post a link to the uh, to the combat page for land warfare in EU4 in uh, in the in the description. So uh, keep that in mind, but once again, thank you for watching. If you liked the video, make sure to like and uh, subscribe if you want to see more strategy gameplay in the future. Uh, thanks, so thank you very much. Have a good one.